Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa. Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa. Internet world, West Alabama, right here in downtown North Florida, a couple miles away from Bryant Denny Stadium. Welcome in to right here on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. I am, of course, Joe Gaither, and you guys are watching us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. You're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Amazon. We're going to have a fun Thursday. Hope you guys are having a great day. We're, what, two days away from homecoming right here in Tuscaloosa. Cannot wait for it. Today is actually episode number 100. So big thanks to Chris Walsh putting me on each and every weekday and getting us to 100 episodes, putting up with all my nonsense each and every day. We're going to have uh, hopefully a fun show today. We had a good show yesterday talking about uh, really everything that's going on through midweek, and we got a little injury update. We kind of debated Malachi Moore's uh, health update and health status. We talked about Mark Stoops just a little bit, and we finished up yesterday's show with a little SEC silly sound. So if you missed any of that, you can check it out on all the platforms. Platforms I just outlined for you. Uh, and we're going to continue on the Arkansas theme two days away from homecoming by welcoming on editor in chief, owner of allhogs.com, Andy Hodges, is going to join us today. You can follow him on the Twitter machine at Andy H Sports. And we are looking forward to getting uh, to know the Razorbacks. Andy, thank you so much for your time and I appreciate you carving out some of your afternoon for us. Well, that's fine, guys. I I appreciate it. It's always good to talk to Alabama people. I love Alabama. Spent a lot of time there uh, over the last 66 years. So going back to the Bear Bryant days. Well, we're bringing you on. Hopefully, you'll be uh, in Tuscaloosa this weekend for Alabama's uh, Alabama's homecoming matchup with the Arkansas Razorbacks. Oh, oh no, I will not be there. You're not so coming. You, okay, all nobody right. Can, nobody can pick on me uh, <laughs> in Tuscaloosa. I I don't travel well anymore. Sure, not not for any health reasons other than sheer laziness. I'm I'm like I'm like Chris. I die, I'm lazy. So I either hire people to do it or um, I'll go here in Fayetteville, but I don't get I don't get out on the road much. Well, well that's all right. Will, will you have a crew here from AllHogs.com in Tuscaloosa or a cup a person or two? I don't think so. I don't think we know what's coming. I mean, we've got enough funerals to go to here. We don't need to go to some port post mortem in Tuscaloosa. Well, that's kind of where I want to begin with you. Yeah, Arkansas two and four already this year uh, on a four-game losing streak. Uh, not what you what you probably expected with KJ Jefferson and Rocket Sanders being back in uh, being back for really KJ's last year in in Arkansas. How have we gotten here? How is Arkansas? Obviously, you lost to LSU, lost to AM, lost to Ole Miss. You dropped a bad one to BYU, but like. How has Arkansas gotten here? I've heard Sam Pittman over the last several weeks complaining about Ar uh, offensive line play. You're obviously breaking in two fresh coordinators, Dan Enos and uh, Travis Williams. But really, how has Arkansas gotten to this place at two and four? I don't know why everybody's surprised. I predicted this back in the preseason. Uh, the same reason that's become painfully obvious now, the offensive line. They don't have the now. I preface this by saying every guy playing on the offensive line is trying his hardest, he's doing the best he can. They are guys with great character. I learned a long time ago, and it was a guy right there in Alabama that told me this. Bear Bryant said, If you got guys with great character, you may not have the best record. <laughs> Because that great character is one thing, but if they can't play, it really uh, doesn't matter. And that's the problem. They're just not very good. And I mean, I, I, I referred to it after, I referred to it on radio after the game last week. This is starting to remind me of the unknowing led by the unwilling into the darkness <laughs> I, I mean it's it's like a new adventure last week but we're game five la game six last week whatever right. it was you've still got offensive linemen running into each other on a play 
I don't care what universe, what level of football you're playing, that's not good. Sure. When you've got the offensive linemen running into each other on a play, they haven't changed the entire offense. Yes, they do have KJ Jefferson, but KJ Jefferson's somewhat limited. He can't read a defense. Uh, for starters, he gets basically one or two reads and off the field he goes. Rocket Sanders has been hampered by injuries all year long. They still don't have a number one receiver that's a true number one receiver. Andrew Armstrong is kind of filling that role right now. But I wouldn't call Andrew a good number one receiver. He's a number two. You, I mean, at Alabama, you've seen this over the years. Y'all... Y'all had a definite number one receiver a few years ago. Then you had number two. Arkansas is starting number two, hoping they can get something out of number three and using a good tight end that's coming on good position there uh, to fill in the gaps. And the tight ends becoming the more reliable go-to position for Arkansas than any of the wide receivers. This is not a surprising issue. Uh, to or it shouldn't be to everybody in Arkansas, but we had the the usual hogs lunatic fringe, as I've called them for 50 years. They th- were predicting nine and ten wins for this team, that wasn't going to happen. And now you've got the obvious everybody wants to hang the coach, the coordinator, the offensive line coach. And everybody else, they just hadn't chosen whether to do it at midfield or on Dixon <laughs> downtown. I, I mean, it's it's one of those situations that we're dealing with here, which is typical. I mean, at, at schools that have this problem, unlike Alabama, that I don't know, y'all have had this since Den, Dennis Franchione was there a year or so. It's it's a situation that's a risk. Uh, a recurring cycle sure. for Arkansas. So it is what it is. Hopefully it'll be good for a quarter or two. Okay. Uh, w- with all that you've just outlined, do you think it's more of a talent efficiency issue or do you think it's a coaching deficiency with, with offensive linemen running into each other? Or do you think that they just, even if they were coached well, maybe aren't uh, capable of protecting KJ Jefferson and generating a running game? I think it's a combination. The offensive line was not gelled with the offensive coordinator. There's something off. And I'm not in the meeting rooms every day. Now, if Sam Pittman would let me come sit in on the meeting rooms for about a week, I could tell you where all the problems are. Sure. But I don't know. And they don't tell us because I don't know what kind of access they have with Alabama. Pretty limited. Yeah. Well, ours is pretty limited too and you can ask a co- I mean now ask me several months after season ends when I've run into Sam enough away from the complex and I'll be able to tell you exactly what happened because he'll tell me but right now he's not going to tell me nor should he sure I mean sure. Uh, no coach should be telling the media what's going on and I'll know right now it's not a clear enough. There are so many problems with the offensive line. It's hard to put your finger and say, well, they're just not coached or they can't play. I tend to think it's a combination of both. Sure. Because in my mind, the definition of a coach is being able to adapt to what his players are physically capable of doing and adjusting his coaching style to handle what his players are physically capable of doing. You don't ask a mule to go out and win the Kentucky Derby. Sure, sure. It ain't going to happen no matter how well you train him. Well, how did you think the uh, the change in the offensive and defensive coordinators has impacted the 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 uh, really the, the offensive line or impacted the season? Because you, you lost uh, you, you you lost the Bryles kid, Kendall Bryles, and you lost uh, Barry Odom. You've replaced him now with Dan Enos, who the name Alabama fans are familiar with, and Travis Williams have 
is it just been an issue? Do you think it's been an issue for those two guys coming in and figuring out what works best for their team? Or is KJ Jefferson really just, he is what he is because he's kind of been the same sort of quarterback. You alluded to it earlier, only reading one or two games. I mean, he's a huge quarterback, big old athlete. Uh, but I agree with you in, in, his, in his inability to, to uh, read the defense. Is he just kind of, it is what it is with KJ and we're just going to have to restart and reset everything when he, when he moves on. I think we go back to 2020, Sam Pittman's first season, and you go to the end of the year when Felipe Franks, who had come in, came in from Florida and provided a large measure of stability and learning for a young KJ who had never really had a chance to start much and didn't play much all year. Against Missouri, the last game, I'm wondering, and guys, I know nothing about this to guarantee it. Sure. But I'm just wondering because there was talk about K.J. Jefferson transferring. And all of a sudden after that Missouri game, he didn't. Did Sam Pittman sell his soul to the devil to keep a K.J. a known quantity when he figured he could build up the rest of the team to go along with him and win some games? They had an experience group in 2021. And you can say what you want to about Chad Morris. He couldn't he couldn't organize a one-car funeral and the <laughs> cemetery is right across the street from the church. I mean, he couldn't get over there without it being some sort of elaborate production. And screw it up. He'd end up at the wrong cemetery or something. <laughs> uh, but he could recruit. You can say what you want to about his coaching relating to players, first one thing and then the other. But he could recruit players. Uh, Sam Pittman was able to win in 2021 with a little bit of luck, which you have to have to win a lot of games. And a bunch of players that had talent. You had a first-round draft choice in Traylon Burks. And some other players that got drafted and have stuck on rosters. He won games with that. They somehow managed to get a six and six record last year. Guys, I don't know. Arkansas coming to town, sitting at two and four, and things aren't looking too good. The wolves are howling, and people smell blood in the water. I don't think Sam's going to be kicked to the curb this season, unless he just completely goes in the tank and they can't even beat Florida International. But I mean, a good showing against uh, – it, it's sad over here, guys. What's the line now, 20? 20. That's what, that was one of my questions for, for you is how you feeling about that line. Arkansas played – I mean, the LSU game, three-point game, seven points with Ole Miss, and really A&M kind of got out of hand. But they've been mostly close throughout the whole, throughout the whole SEC season. Well, I think, first of all, the transfer portal has created parity. Yes. Across all of college as sports, not just football. It's more vivid in college football because that's what we in the South, we think it's football and nothing else right down in the South. And uh, that's what they pay attention to the most. But it's created some parity. You've got some coaches that are good at dealing with it. Mm -hmm. You've got some other coaches don't like it, don't want to deal with it, and they think they can keep doing what they've been doing to a certain extent and keep having the success that they've had. I think Dabo Sweeney at Clemson is finding out, no, you better change. You better adapt or die. And I don't know whether Nick Saban has embraced it fully yet. Yeah. I think he kind of has. But he hadn't gone all in on it. Sure. And, you know, it, it's created parity, so you're going to have a lot of these close games. I think it probably will be close for a little bit. But then, hey, you know, my general feeling, and granted, I'm one of the more cynical people. You know, I mean, I've been here and seen it for so many years. I just... It, this is not a desire that I want the Razorbacks to be bad. They just tend to be a lot lately. 
they'll keep it closed for two or three quarters, and then Alabama's got more players, and that's the problem Arkansas has. You have to have 40 players that are really good to compete for a championship. Really good. Arkansas has got about six players that could go to an Alabama, go to Georgia, LSU, those places, and compete for a starting job seriously and have a reasonable chance of getting it. Now, you're not going to win a lot of games with a roster with that kind of depth because the old days and a lot of old timers I still hear, well, they got a good, they got real good 22 players. Yeah, okay. They're pretty good. You need more than 22. Absolutely. Because nobody plays every snap. It's not like when I play. We go out there and play every down, and occasionally you'd let your backup come in so you could go over on the sidelines and get a drink of water or whatever. Right. Nowadays, it looks like hockey line shifts going on out there. Oh, Alabama's playing eight, nine defensive linemen yeah. throughout the entire game. I mean, Arkansas has got four defensive linemen. Four. It gets real thin after that. Yeah. Arkansas's linebacker core is two. And a lot of question marks behind them. And one of those fellas, Poopal, is uh, maybe questionable for the weekend. Is that what I've been understanding? Poopal lives very close to me here in Fayetteville. I say Poo on a regular basis, and I'll, I'll put it like this. I'll be surprised if Poopal makes it 10 plays. That's unfortunate. And I don't know how effective he's going to be in those 10 plays. Now, who knows? They may give him an injection. I I, I don't know. I've sure. seen stranger things happen. I've seen guys that I thought on Wednesday <clears throat> were going to have to have a, a limb amputated. <laughs> end up looking like they should win the Heisman Trophy on Saturday. So I'm not saying that for sure, but I don't think Pooh is going to be anywhere close to 100%. I don't think he's 75%. But they may have to put him on the field because what's behind him ain't any good. I mean, they may be good players eventually, but they don't have experience. And unless you can overcome it with incredible talent, you got to have experience to play in the SEC at a high level against teams like Alabama. And Alabama's the type team that causes Arkansas a lot of problems. And I'm assuming Alabama doesn't have a bunch of stark idiots in the offensive room. They watch film too. They they are going to be aware of the problems with the Arkansas, they can't stop a scrambling quarterback. Well, that's going to be stop the same type quarterback that they have, and that's what Jalen Milrow is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll we'll flip to that side of the ball. What what has been your impression, uh, just from the Arkansas side of things, with the Alabama progression of the season? I guess everybody's you know has different thoughts of what Alabama is going to be going into the year kind of maybe it changed during the Texas game and maybe has changed again since the A&M game. What's been your perspective on the Alabama season? I think Alabama was still trying to figure it out when they started the season, and this is a result of what we see in the day and age of the transfer portal. You're starting to figure it out after the season. Look, guys, you can just get so much against practice and against each other. Coaches, anything they say before the first game is played is just a guess. They're projecting. And even the best projecting coaches, sometimes they hit, sometimes they miss. That guy don't look as good when the bright lights come on, the band starts playing, mom and daddy sitting in the stands beaming and smiling. And everybody's real happy, and that little girlfriend's just excited that he's out there, and then he goes out, and he couldn't play dead in the cowboy movie. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes that happens. But it, take, it took a while with the new offensive coaching staff and other things. 
And I think it just took Alabama a couple of games, and Texas came in ready for that game. Steve Sarkeesian had them ready to play the game. I think Texas probably played a notch above its ability. I think Alabama probably pay, played a notch or two below its ability. But they Texas got the momentum and rode the wave. And that happens at times. Then they kind of I, – I, look, you guys watched it more than I did. I don't have a clue what the hell happened against South Florida. <laughs> I don't really either. I think there was a little effort problem. I think there was a lot of experimentation from the coaching staff to try to say, you know, we're, we're throwing this out there, that out there, whatever works, and we're, we're going to trim everything down for the rest of the year. I mean, I'm pretty sure nobody on Nick Saban's staff went home for a couple of nights. Sure. <laughs> I agree, Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know that. I don't even know in this day and age if coaches can do that anymore. But I'm pretty sure there wasn't a lot of sleep even if they did go home. I mean, look, on Nick Saban's staff, you have a two or three divorces every year, a couple of ulcers, guys that become heart patients at the closest heart doctor. I mean, that's just part and parcel of working for Nick Saban. A thousand percent. And Steve Sarkeesian had open heart surgery. You've lost Pete Golding because of yeah. family issues in the last year. Uh, Dan Enos, you mean guy you're familiar with, left Tuscaloosa to go to Miami largely due to spending time with his family. It happens. That's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, Dan Enos likes to spend more time with his family than he does coach, which is why I was kind of shocked he was hired back here again, but. That's just a personal opinion. What do I know? I think that that's largely fair. I, I think he prioritizes his time with his family, from what I was told it, when it, during his time in Tuscaloosa. I mean, it's it's like I saw Sam at a social occasion we were both at uh, back in the summer at Ruth's Chris Restaurant, and we were standing there talking, and I said, what the hell did you hire Dan Enos for? <laughs> And of course, you know, he stomped around the answer and stuff. And I didn't, I did let me put this way. I didn't get the reply I was expecting, which sounded like a solid endorsement and sounded more to me like he just wanted the drama every year involving Kendall Brawls out of town. And he was going to get somebody he was familiar with to fill the hole. So that's purely a guess. Don't sure. take that as breaking news sure, sure, or anything else. That's just purely a gut feel for the situation. And the results have shown Dan Enos is obviously spending a lot of time with his family. Well, how will that play out for Sam Pittman down the line? Because you look and you kind of already outlined that you think he will survive, but the rest of their SEC schedule, you're at Bama, you have State at home. State's terrible. They're they're terrible. You're going to Florida. Auburn is at home again, but and Auburn, you know, they're not talented, but they've been well coached this year. And then Missouri at home, who I think falls in the same sort of category. Uh, well, good offense, well coached, but just not overly talented. How do you think this is going to play out for the rest of the Arkansas season? Will they win an SEC game? Will they finish bottom of the SEC West, or will they kind of get to six or five in the SEC West? If you find a way to answer that question definitively, call me and tell me. Sure, and I, sure. I will back the investment in Vegas. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> never underestimate the Hogs' ability that's proven over the last 66 years that I'm aware of to play down to the level of their competition or up to the level of their competition. I don't know how the rest of the season's going to play out. They may, they may, depending on if what happens Saturday night, what I think is going to happen, they're going to be two and five sitting here Sunday. Right. And this is not going to be a happy crowd around there. The fans are already restless. They haven't beaten Alabama since 2006. Right. You know, the 
Tiffin kid missed, missed every, about five field goals. <laughs> he kicked it everywhere in Razorback Stadium except between the goalposts. Yes. And uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I will say this. Sam is uh, pushing 62 years old. Sam bought a place on Lake Hamilton, which is outside Hot Springs in central Arkansas. Sam's contract has a mitigation clause in it. And as soon as I saw it, I said, this is the get out of jail free card for everybody. It has a mitigation clause in it where the University of Arkansas can pay him a reduced amount if he does not seek similar employment if he's fired before the age of 65. That means, and he's only got three years left till he's right. turned 65. Right. Okay. Tell you what, guys. Let's negotiate this thing out where I retire. I go sit out there by my lake, holler go hogs at everybody that drives by on the lake. He's got a Razorback statue shooting water out of his mouth <laughs> and all this stuff. Awesome. You know, he can go down there and drink beer and wave at everybody going by on the lake. Uh, the University of Arkansas is happy because they get out of it for a reduced amount on the buyout and everybody walks away smiling and they don't have lawsuits. Remember, they've been in lawsuits with the last two football coaches that they've had here trying to fire them. So Arkansas can't even fire them gracefully. But, um, I mean, I, I don't know. You've got a combination of age a career assistant who got the head coaching job at Arkansas, in my opinion, because they'd been turned down by Mike Leach and Lane Kiffin. Uh, they got turned down by the guy at uh, Iowa State. What's his name? I can't even remember. Uh, the guy up there wouldn't even talk to him. Uh, they had other people that just said thanks, but no thanks. And... I think Sam was about the best choice they have. If nothing else, they learned don't talk to ex-coaches about a player, whether he should be hired as a head coach or not, because they don't know. They just liked the guy personally because they enjoyed playing for him. Sure, uh, it's, a, it's a situation where everybody can get out gracefully, so it kind of changes the pattern that a lot of people think the leash is pretty long for Sam Pittman. I don't think it's that long. I think it's a way for a negotiated buyout. Everybody walks away happy and moves on down the road. But this is a talent problem this year more than anything else. They haven't recruited any, they haven't recruited enough good players or brought in enough on the transfer portal. They're signing too many guys from Akron. And you lost you lost your best player to Texas, your your best defensive player really to Texas in the portal. Is Jalen Catalan doing that much with Texas? No, but he was pretty. He had a pretty nice nice year last year for Arkansas. I stayed hurt most of the time. Again, has he done anything at Texas? That shoulder that he's he's injured for three straight years. By that point in time. It's a recurring thing, Joe. Sure, sure. It, it, you got a problem that ain't going to be fixed. You've got a chronic problem, and you think, buddy, you got problems now. Wait till you're 60 years old. <laughs> and there ain't no shoulder, you know, there ain't no way they can replace all this like they can a hip or a knee. Right. Uh, you're going to really pay the price by the time you're 60 years old. It's a chronic problem. And, I mean, Jalen could hit people. And when I looked at watched him play as a freshman, I said, okay, the only thing that makes this guy great is he knocks the hell out of people. Well, they kicked him out, kicked him out of a couple of games. I'm like, see, it ain't that great a deal to be able to do that anymore. Sure. 
Well, you've seen, you know, you've seen kind of interesting off the field issues with the coaching staff. We're talking about Andy Hodges of allhogs.com. Make sure you go check him out at allhogs.com and follow him at Andy H Sports on the Twitter X machine. You've seen some interesting things off the field. Sam Pittman, I mean, you talk about talent issue. Sam Pittman has gone off of social media, onto social media. He's complained about, oh, gosh, everybody's getting on my case. And he's complained about, every, I'm having to play counselor to my punter and counselor to my offensive lineman. And then subsequently, we already talked about Danny. Danny knows just a minute, but Danny knows after the Texas A&M game is emailing back and forth with fans. Oh, you can do better. You what call, what play call would you call? This, that, and the other. There seems to be a lot of listening to outside noise and and, and so I want to ask you about th- those two aspects and kind of if how insulated those th- they are how focused they are on really the job at hand you kind of already hinted at the family uh, dynamic with Dan Enos and then secondarily going back to the talent issue from the outside perspective I see Sam Pittman and everybody sees Sam Pittman and they think oh great perfect marriage with Arkansas he's a Razorback you know offensive line coach tough guy they're gonna work together you see that and then you see the results are just not really panning out but then you look I'm just gonna bring in another program you look at the basketball program they're in on every single five-star recruit they're in on every single transferee that might be good and people think oh the Waltons oh everybody throwing NIL money this that and the other we've kind of talked about transfer portal already what's Sam Pittman's issue with marrying the the, the NIL together getting people to Fayetteville getting talent into Fayetteville I I know that's a lot of different kind of uh subjects thrown into one but I kind of think they all tie together a little bit what do you think is the issue with uh the recruiting aspect or bringing talent into Fayetteville you know Sam Pittman spent over 35 years preparing to be a head coach yes was never a coordinator a position coach, an offensive line coach at that primarily. He's never had experience with that. He spends over 35 years preparing, and then in less than 60 days, everything he learned got thrown in the trash because all of the rules changed. Sure, very true. COVID hit. All of a sudden... Players could find ways to legally make money. I don't know why anybody, the only thing that happened was they took it off the bottom of the table and put it (laughs) on the top of the table. Yes, yes. Hey, this went on back to my days when you came came in the locker room after games and all of a sudden you had a couple of hundred bucks stuffed in your shoe. Well, where the hell did that come from? I didn't have that last night. Sure. I needed it last night. Uh, Type situation. And you've got players can leave. You have uh, basically now in college sports, you have more unrestricted free agency than you do in the National Football League or the NBA. Players can just go, "Eh, I don't like the coach. I'm going to transfer. If he hadn't played in four games, he doesn't even lose a year of eligibility. Right. Now, you can argue, well, those rules aren't fair. That's not right, et cetera. Guys, we really don't matter. Nobody cares what we think. That's the way, and that's the way most coaches view it. I got to win games no matter what the rules are because I can't walk in to, if the athletic director says you're fired, I can't walk in and go, well, those rules shouldn't be that way. Therefore, I should get stuck. Well, sorry. Play by the rules as they are. I don't care what the rules are. Just, yeah. you know, tell me what they are and get out of the way. Well, some coaches don't know how to do that in this day and age. They're like me. I have not embraced social media. I'm, I, I have accounts. And I got news for folks. I don't run my own social media account. Don't look at it. Don't check it. I have people that when somebody sends me a message, they say, you need to read this message. That's the only time I look at it. I mean, I look, I don't care what you ate for lunch. I don't care what you ate last night for dinner. I don't care what <laughs> drama you got going on in your life. Sure. Because complaining about your problems. Coach Lou Holtz said up here one time, he said, 
Don't waste time complaining. He said, number one, 75% of the people don't care. Another 10% are glad you're having the problem. The rest will just tell you that they're interested just to be friendly. But most, by and large, most people don't care what your problems are. They have their own problems. Certainly. Well, college football is the same way. They don't care what your problem is. Lane Kiffin has embraced social media, embraced it before it was popular. He knows how to deal with it. He knows how to manage it. The coaches that have embraced it know how to play the game on there or have someone on their staff that knows how to play the game. Eric Musselman's wife, Danielle, is the greatest marketing machine at the University of Arkansas. They have a whole team of these little guys that walk around campus like this. (laughs) I mean, they're looking down at their phones. I I just keep going, you know, one of these days, I'm going to throw something out there in front of them just to see how far they'll fall. (laughs) <laughs> when they hit it. Sure. I mean, I keep threatening to do that all the time. Uh, does Musk do that? I think he looks at social media more than Sam does. But the problem is that can get into your head if you listen to people. Yeah. And quite frankly, Sam's never been the focal point of criticism. Nick Saban deals with it because He's been the focal point of criticism for a lot of years. Yeah. He's heard it from everybody. And you pretty much soon it's, you know, kind of like me because I've been married and divorced four times. All right. There's a lot of it. I just don't even pay attention to anymore. Who cares? And you just roll with the punches. Sam can't do that. He takes too much of it personally. I mean, think about it. Sam Pittman's nearly 62 years old. He's only been married one time. Kudos to him, his wife, Janie. She's been a coach's wife for I don't know how long. And they have no kids. So Sam Pittman's never had to put up with the heat that can be turned on a coach now. And if you take it all personally, you're not going to sleep much at night worrying about people that don't matter. A thousand percent. Because because Johnny Hogg's 254-318 or whatever doesn't really – he's never going to call a play. And the athletic director is not going to make decisions really off Johnny Hogg, you know, a bunch of numbers. Yeah, nobody really cares what Johnny Hogg thinks. Right, and the same thing for Bubba Gump right here on on, on any on any uh, social media. And like, look, I love you if you follow me. Uh, honestly, thank you for doing that. But like, I, I, I look at it, and people sometimes people say, "Oh, Joe's, or, oh, you can't keep your microphone plugged in." Blah, blah, blah. I just let it roll off my like. It's not that big of a deal to me because uh, I've grown up with it, and I just know that man, eh, it's just just commenters, it's just people looking to have some fun with their with themselves for five minutes. I mean, going back to when I played and stuff, coming out all the way back to junior high, I came from a very sports-oriented town, and we we won. We also produced a lot of wide receivers, but we won. We won championships. I mean, the head football coach at my hometown of Warren High School in Arkansas – if the coach doesn't make the the semifinals, at least a state tournament, he's automatically assuming his ass is fired before he gets back to Warren. I mean, that's just the way, you know, it is. And then at Arkansas, you know, it's, it's another high pressure you hear from all this. I learned how to deal with criticism and stuff and people that don't matter. And the other thing, 90... Nine percent of the fans complaining have no idea at all the way college football or any football works. And you can start whenever they start with the play calling sucks. That's the first clue that they know absolutely nothing about football. 
because nobody, the coach, the coordinator, nobody knows what play is going to actually be run until they see the play come out. Because nowadays they just send in personnel and formation and groupings. So much of the play is determined by pre-snap read and in a lot of offenses, post-snap reads. Mm -hmm. RPO, big time, huge. And as a wide receiver, even back 45 years ago, we had to be in tune with the quarterback, and both of us see the same thing with the defensive backs or we look like an idiot and the quarterback's throwing it out there and ain't anybody in the same zip code. Well, now it's even worse because you've got more pre-snap reading that goes on with the shotgun and stuff. And people are just guessing what play. I, I as Sam, Sam Pittman referred to it to me one time as their suggestions. <laughs> Because I know this for a fact, there have been plays called that were not run because the quarterback thought he saw something else and had the ability to audible. It's all based on what everybody is reading. Play calling is, when fans start with that, I immediately tune them out. They have no clue what they're talking. They still think the coach is like in sixth grade little league football. Coach sends in 32 right on three. Okay, you get in a huddle, call a subcommittee meeting, 32-3, all, you know, break. We all go out there, run the play. It's pretty simple. Well, no. No. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like going in and listening to them give you the disclaimers before an IRS audit now just to run a single offensive play. Absolutely. And it's all based on how the defense lines up, how they react if you send people in motion or shift people. If the defense drops a linebacker back or walks away and in, you change the play or change what you're going to do. Instead of you keeping it outside, you hand it to the running back running inside. Hope for the best. Or if you're going to throw it over here and all of a sudden they flip from a man to a zone defense and double cover that wide receiver, unless you're a complete idiot, you're not throwing into double coverage. Sure. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So you have to tune all those idiots out because they have no idea. The Once you get past the ball is blown up with air and not stuffed with duck feathers, you've eliminated – most of what people know about college sports. Well, Arkansas is coming to Tuscaloosa this weekend, 11 o'clock on Saturday. It's Alabama's homecoming. You kind of outlined a little bit about your feelings. Let's say, Andy Hodges, you are the head coach. Put you in Sam Pittman's back pocket. How does Arkansas keep this game close, schematically or just uh, just from a talent standpoint? Obviously, the talent you've already outlined don't have enough bodies to really hang in there. But how would you ha- keep this game close? You, 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 you've played close games with Ole Miss, who really challenged Alabama here in Tuscaloosa. You played a real close game in Death Valley. So the road doesn't, you know, the road isn't necessarily that big of a hurdle, road games, that is. 11 a.m. in Tuscaloosa, half of Alabama will be asleep. Uh, how would you keep this game close as we wrap up our conversation or even get yourself to a win, get yourself huge win. It would be a, it'd be Sam Pittman's biggest win. (laughs) You tell the offensive lineman you're being criticized. Tune out the noise. Maybe you can't do this. Maybe you can't do this, but you can do this. Fire out straight ahead. Block the first guy that's wearing a red jersey in front of you. We're going to turn around. We're going to give the ball to Rocket until he drops or gets killed. We're going to keep this thing simple, get into the fourth quarter and see where we are, guys. And then we're going to cut it loose with some other things because if nothing else, maybe some of them decided to quit at halftime or whatever. 
And who knows what will happen in the second half. If oh, the game that. stays close, the rear ends in Bryant-Denny Stadium will get tight, 100%. Yeah, and we're going to keep this thing close, get it to the fourth quarter, and see what happens. You come out flinging it around and stuff, I think that plays into exactly what Alabama can do because I'm not real clear, but this is – most of Alabama's problems are on the offensive side this year. Yeah, yeah. Ain't nobody said a word about their defense. Uh, not a word. Defense is pretty I, – I like what you've seen so far. And if they can rush the passer, it could be a tough day for K.J., and plus, you've got the mindset. Alabama's still got title hopes in their mind. Certainly. Realistic shot, a realistic path of making the college football playoff. Arkansas hadn't got a shot at winning the SEC West. What's the mentality of the game going to be like? What's the mentality? Are they happy just being the spoiler? Or, and here's the wild card that you have to take into account in this day and age. Are they already looking at teams for next year because they know they can hit that transfer portal and start trying to sell themselves to the program they want to go to next year? And don't tell me that doesn't go on in this day and age. Oh, it has to, especially, oh, I mean, right now at two and four, four losses in a row, it has to. I mean, Not to be disrespectful, but it, it just has to. That's going on. You got guys that are sitting there that are maybe not playing the amount of plays they want. Yeah. Or think they should, or mom and daddy's telling them. Yes. You've got guys looking at that. So what's the mentality going to be? And the only way you keep the mentality of this team from not giving up because it's been a mental thing a lot for the last 20 years with Arkansas against Alabama. Bobby Petrino talked about it before the after the 2009 game. He said, this is my fault because we, we knew we were going to get beat before we ever set foot on the field, before they ever went down to Tuscaloosa. Well, there ain't nobody giving Arkansas a shot. To, the goal of most people from Arkansas – is to stay within double digits. If they can accomplish that, they'll be happy, which for guys like me, that drives me absolutely crazy. Because yeah. if you ain't playing for a championship, why are you even playing? I'm not interested in how good a bowl game you go to. If you ain't playing for a championship, why are you even on the field? I mean, I have to invent stuff still in my old age to compete at in business and everything else. Everything is a competition. And what's the mentality going to be? Are the players already looking at the transfer portal? So the solution to that, in my opinion, is keep everything simple. Just tell the offensive line, you can go straight ahead. Sure. This is not... Anything complicated to figure it out. You go straight ahead and block the first guy in front of you and try to put his butt on the ground. Wide receivers, you block. When we call a pass, get open, catch the ball. Don't make a big play, just make a play. KJ, don't try to win the game by yourself because, son, you ain't going to do it. I think that's a big, big, big potential to create problems. Rocket Sanders, uh, Rashad DeBinion, A.J. Green, if he's back this week, I have no idea. We're going to give you the ball, and we're going to make it real simple. Run where they aren't. Run away from the guys in the red jerseys. Because quite frankly, I think that's the only prayer Arkansas has of keeping it close. Make the game short. Sure. Keep the clock running as much as possible, make it short, get it to the fourth quarter where you have a realistic shot of doing something 
and then see what happens. Who knows? You never know. Defensively, try to confuse Jalen Milrow. That's the only hope you got because man-to-man, just a straight matchup, you really don't match up that well. So let's try to confuse Jalen Milrow, and we're going to blitz him. He's not going to beat us with us having linebackers sitting back there going, what is this? What are them popcorn eat good tonight? No, we bring in everybody but the cheerleaders, and we'll try to slip one of them out there if we can. <laughs> we bring in everybody because what have we got to lose? That, that's what I would be doing as well from the defensive side of the ball. You've seen Mississippi State – Sit back, rush three with a spy, and then put the la- everybody in, in co- zone coverage, and just just get b- beat really underneath. Uh, and then last week, A and M, when they blitzed, it was effective. When they sat back and only brought three or four, Milro tore, tore them apart. No, you picked up a couple of blitzes and got down the field, but I would be sending everybody all the time. And what's Travis Williams' reputation? Blitz, blitz. Blitz. Now, if Row can beat the blitz, if they beat the blitz, they beat the blitz. Sure. At least you made it a quick death, not a slow one. <laughs> Just bring the house. And don't let Alabama sit there and dink and dunk five yards of play going down the field. That's what you want your offense to do. Get five yards, go down the field, drain the clock. Let Cam Little kick a field goal. By the way, Cam Little, the Arkansas kicker, hit a 68-yarder at practice. I heard Sam Pittman say that. Isn't that wild? I mean, that's going back to kicking back in my day. (laughs) That's pretty nuts. Uh, I would like to see that on Saturday, uh, just to to see that in person, just to see how far he can kick it. That'd be awesome. I mean, it's it's, – that was regular back in my day. I mean, the old – Southwest Conference, we had the best kickers in the country. At one time, we had three kickers that kicked 67-yard field goals. So, I mean, it was – I was used to seeing those bombs long range. And those bombs, they're always interesting to watch because you stand there, you hit one or you sit there and watch it, and you're going, huh, I wonder if that sucker stay in the air long enough somebody to shoot it like a duck. Well, why would you so well, I mean I'm I'm unfamiliar with with those with that length. Why was it kickers ability changes or was it coaches not willing to take the chances? Uh what, what cuz that's what it seems like to me. Uh well, what do you think the uh what do you think the yes, reason to all, yes to all of the above. Okay. Uh first of all, leg strength has nothing to do with kicking a ball soccer style. It's about form, technique and your leg whip that puts the distance to the ball. Number two, they were longer back in the 70s than what they have now because rule number one, we didn't have to use the game ball being used. We could take and use this ball every day for two years, beat it up, leave it outside. I mean, this thing was not beat down to where the laces were just like worn in, nearly gone. Yeah. I mean, it, that sucker was worn out, looked more like a rugby ball than a football. Okay. Number two, we kicked off a two-inch tee. Get a little number, high. number three, if we kicked it in the end zone, the ball came back to the 20, not where we kicked it. Okay, okay. The same reason in punting, we were told, just kick the thing out of the back of the end zone. Don't worry about all this kicking, you know, out of bounds and trying to hang it up. But I know this. Mo- I know this for a fact. The numbers are there to prove it. Most shanks, the overwhelming majority of shanked punts happen when they are trying to get too cute with where they put the ball, get them down somewhere close, whatever, and how many times do you see the worst shanks, a right-footed punter angling it 
for the right sideline. That's exactly what happened with James Burnup last week. Exactly. That's the dumbest and num- violates rule number one that I learned when I was five years old punting a football. If you're going to kick it out of bounds in your right leg, kick it to the left sideline. So if you shank it off the outside part of your foot, which happens 99% of the time, you shank it back into the middle of the field and at least you get distance. You don't kick the thing out of bounds on the line of scrimmage. It was like a 50, it was like a 23 yard punt, something like that last week. Uh set up s- s- sets up uh AM for their first for their first score. Good lord. I'm 66 years old. I could punt one 23 yards over the back of my head backwards. <laughs> Well, Andy, this has been an absolute blast for me. I really appreciate your time today. We've been talking to Andy Hodges of allhogs.com. Arkansas coming to Tuscaloosa, 11 a.m. on Saturday. Homecoming right here in Tuscaloosa. Anything that we might have missed that is important to talk about for Arkansas's perspective or anything that uh, Alabama fans should be noticing with the Razorbacks when they come into Tuscaloosa as we get you out of here? Well, let's see. We covered the kicker. The quarterback's got issues. We have no idea what the backup quarterback can do behind him. We hadn't seen one this year. We assume one's on the roster, but we haven't seen them in a game. The defense, they have question marks. They have a lack of depth. And that's the biggest difference between these two teams. Alabama's deeper yeah, with more talent than Arkansas is. It's an early morning game. Hopefully Alabama will miss the wake-up call and sleep (laughs) through it. And Alabama fans, get ready because basketball is coming. And the (laughs) bus bus is headed to the Final Four. Woo! I can't wait for a basketball. I'm looking forward. What is it? Uh, 20... 29 days, 28 days, I think it was uh, from, from uh, November 6th. Though I cannot wait for that. Yeah, we've got our we've got the first exhibition game up here the 20th of October, which is uh, just a little over a week away. And we got it, but we got Alabama in the targets this year. Well, we can't wait for it. I love that what the rivalry has become. Uh, and, and you you, uh, you spoke about traveling earlier. Uh, maybe come up to Tuscaloosa for that for that matchup. I think we're going home and home again this year. I don't know. I'm more likely to come for basketball than yeah. baseball. Not because I don't love Alabama football. I do. What I don't like is fighting the crowd. Certainly, certainly. And quite frankly, the way football's played now with the long timeouts and everything else i can cover it more better more and better sitting in my office where i've got three 65 inch tvs set up in front of the desk and stuff and my office chair here reclines into it reclines with a footrest so what's and I can control the food. Certainly. The food, the bathroom lines, everything is much, much better at, at the house usually. Yeah, I mean, I've even got it positioned where I can go sit in a hot tub and watch games on the TV. Why do I really want to go to a game? <laughs> I wouldn't if I were you in that situation, especially considering uh, what you're seeing on the field. Now, basketball is a different situation because I shoot photos at basketball. I'll be I'll be right down there beside the Alabama bench shooting basketball. That's my spot. We'll give my friend Nate Oates a, a high five when you see him this year. I don't know that Nate will talk to me. Some of the coaches on the other teams do, and so a lot of the officials I've known for years and years, and we carry on a complete running dialogue during the game. So I'm the old white haired guy in a black shirt sitting on, sitting down by the visitors bench at Arkansas games. And I have somewhat people that know me are like, why do they even let you down there considering how crazy you are? (laughs) I mean, really? Uh, But they do, they keep letting me. So. Well, as long as they keep letting you, we'll keep reading you at allhogs.com. I really can't wait for this weekend. And, yes, I'm like you. I, I, I prefer the basketball to the football because, I don't know, I just am hungrier for for, for basketball success. I, I mean, after seeing 
I mean, I, another national championship, Coach Saban, I'll take one. But after seeing six, it's just kind of like old hat at this point. I'm desperate to uh, desperate to see some more basketball success. Well, at Arkansas, we can talk trash on basketball. Certainly, certainly. Football, we we just like, please don't beat us too bad. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of the mode that it's in. In baseball, we're pretty good, too. Certainly, certainly. I mean, we we beat Alabama in baseball and beat them so bad the coach bet money on it. So <laughs> oh, that was a horrible situation. Awful, awful. That was right around the time when all that was starting to break. When yes. They came to Fayetteville and played that. I'm, I'm sure he threw that game as well. Uh, reckless speculation. I, it, didn't, it didn't look to me like there was any throwing going on, but that's a very hard thing to account for anyway. So, I mean, hey, one of my best friends back in college days was a kicker named Steve Little. He hauled off one time in a game and kicked it sideways on an extra point. I'm like, what the hell was that about? I said, I always wanted to see what Coach Brawls would say. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, no. You got to kick it to the upright, young man. Uh, uh, well, I mean, he was the All-American kicker. Brawls didn't say much other than what happened. Because that was back in the days when there was only about three of us soccer-style kickers in existence that weren't playing in the NFL from a European country. And the coaches had no idea what we were doing. Sure, sure. They didn't even know how to coach it. So, I mean, they're like, I go run laps. I, <laughs> I don't know anything else to tell you. Well, Andy, I'll I'll go, you know, do that. But, hey, it's been great. I had fun. Read all hogs. Read Bama Central. Uh, tell Chris he needs to work and quit hiring people to do it. <laughs> I will. I will. I love working for Chris, but I'll pass along the message. Absolutely. Andy, uh, thank you so much and have a great day. Coach. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's Andy Hodges joining us from allhogs.com. Really, really appreciate him. He is with us at the Sports Illustrated Fan Nation affiliate. He covers everything over in Arkansas, and it was a blast. It was absolutely a blast. Oh, <laughs> my man, CJ Watson chiming in, expecting a lively show tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be a Football Friday edition. We'll have Katie Wyndham. We'll have Blake Byler. We'll have Austin Hannon. Austin Hannon is going to be putting out a great piece on the 2007 Alabama-Arkansas game. He's interviewed Matt Cadell. He's interviewed John Parker Wilson. So he's going to be putting out a great piece on the 07 Alabama-Arkansas game tomorrow morning on BamaCentral.com. We're looking forward to reading that. We'll see if Chris Walsh wants to join us tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's going to be a lot. Like, look, it's, it's homecoming weekend. We're going to have as much fun as we can. Alabama, a 20 point favorite tomorrow. Or, excuse me, Saturday, Saturday. I do feel like Alabama's going to cover that line, but it's a little bit on the high side. Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I will continue to watch Arkansas film. I'm in the middle of Arkansas Ole Miss from last weekend on my DVR, on my ESPN+. Plus. Uh, guys, you can follow me at Joe Gaither 6 on the social media machines. Send me a comment, a question, query, and complaint, just like my friend CJ Watson did today, chiming in on the episode. You can uh, go tell Andy Hodges at Andy H Sports that you're thankful for his time and talk a little trash to him if you like subscribe to other Bama Central Broadcasting Network podcast Blue Collar Unplugged Blake Byler Matthew Gibson and Jacob Pickle they're getting ready to do some big big things with Blue Collar Unplugged as we just mentioned basketball is coming soon we'll have to catch back up with Andy during basketball season oh my gosh the bitter rivalry I wanted to be respectful of Andy for and his time but golly I have bitter feelings towards Arkansas and Auburn on the basketball court. That'll be a fun conversation here uh, a couple of months away when we open SEC play. Big thanks to everybody who watched us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, who listened to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Amazon. You can subscribe, rate, review the program, give me a little five star, give me a little one star, leave a comment, share it with a friend, an Alabama fan uh, or an SEC fan or just anybody that you think might enjoy the program. I would really, really appreciate it. We'll be back with another episode on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. It'll be Football Friday tomorrow with Katie Wyndham, Mike Byler, Austin Hannon, all the people we can find on the Bama Central staff joining us for Football Friday tomorrow on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com.